He had made Jean Armour pregnant and then been forced to endure the humiliation of her father burning the private marriage contract he had made with her. Burns found a very Scottish answer to his despair. He would emigrate with Highland Mary, but she died of a fever at Greenock, waiting to leave with him. At 27, his life had all the coherence of a shipwreck. The transforming event proved to be the publication of his poems. They were utterances of such verbal energy, emotional force and intellectual clarity, they must have had the impact of a thunderstorm, drenching his readers in the reality of his experience. The scandal of Ayrshire was the wonder of Edinburgh. He was now 28. Referring to this transformation in the life of Burns, Thomas Carlyle has written, This month he is a ruined peasant, his wages seven pounds a year, and these gone from him. Next month, he is in the blaze of rank and beauty, handing down jeweled duchesses to dinner. Fame seems not to have found him wanting. He was handsome, effortlessly charming, and about as dull as an active volcano. It has been said of him that when he stopped at an inn for the night, the servants had been known to get out of bed just to hear him talking. No intelligence intimidated him. I suspect he had more than a touch of intellectual machismo. Who's got a better mind than I've got? Where are they? When Walter Scott was 15, he met Robert Burns, and the impression stayed indelibly on his mind. The eye alone, I think, indicated the poetical character and temperament. It was large and of a dark cast, which glowed, I say literally, glowed when he spoke with feeling or interest. I never saw such another eye in a human head though I have seen the most distinguished men of my time. His conversation expressed perfect self-confidence without the slightest presumption. The admiration Burns met with in Edinburgh is all the more remarkable because the city had some claim to being one of the intellectual centres of Europe. A visiting Englishman was quoted as observing, Here I stand at what is called the Cross of Edinburgh and can in a few minutes take 50 men of learning and genius by the hand. It was the time that has been called the Scottish Enlightenment. The Act of Union of 1707, when self-government was sold and Scotland began to be administered from London, was followed by a phase of intense intellectual activity. It was as if the country was determined to declare its national identity through the mind. The most famous encyclopedia in the world might declare the unity of the British Isles, but the title page of the first edition acknowledged it to be the work of a society of Scottish gentlemen. No branch of learning was beyond the curiosity of such gentlemen. Joseph Black developed the theory of latent heat. Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, has never been out of print since it was published in 1776. David Hume has been regarded by some as the greatest philosopher in the English language. Robert Adam was an architect whose influence spread to Russia and America. Men of such intellectual stature and vision gave Scotland a window in the world. The importance they attributed to the Grand Tour, the idea of travel as a means of education, illustrated the absence of parochialism in their outlook. Yet hand in hand with this rational sophistication went the romantic notion of natural man, a rather naive belief in the purity of primitive society before it became urbanized. Burns was simultaneously both a part of this enlightenment and yet separate from it. His grand tour, for example, was restricted to Scotland, a vernacular version as it were. 1787 was the first time in his life when he had sufficient time and money to travel and he made four tours of the country. His poems had made him a national figure and his journeys were in part a kind of triumphal procession. His success in Edinburgh had gone ahead of him. But it wasn't just the public man who set out from Edinburgh on the 25th of August, 1787. On any journey, we tend to take our worries and preoccupations along with us like luggage. The post chaise in which Burns set out was fairly well loaded with the unresolved problems of a troubled past and the uncertainties of a doubtful future. He was the man of the moment, but it's in the nature of moments not to last. What would be waiting for him at the end of it? 
Well, the affair with Jean Armour had stamped it up again. Her father apparently found a well-known poet who had received the freedom of three boroughs more acceptable than a womanizing plowman. Then again, Burns hadn't written much poetry for some time, and most writers tend increasingly to doubt their gift the longer they are away from confronting a blank page. And it's hard to believe that Burns's Edinburgh experience hadn't confused his sense of himself. Imagine the psychological distance he had traveled from Ayrshire. This was a man who had come very close to despair, and then by producing one book of words, had created an effect almost as magical as Open Sesame. It seemed that he had stumbled upon an Alibaba's cave of possibilities. It must have been a very divided man who set out from Edinburgh. Perhaps that confusion about himself, about who he was, about where he was going, about what he was going to do, is illustrated by his choice of a traveling companion, a man called Wooly Nickel. Most of Bunsey's newfound friends disapproved of Wooly Nickel. He was a man from a background not dissimilar to Bunsey, a lad of Peart's, a fine classical scholar, but also a man given to drink and anger, and frequently both at the same time. Burns himself said that traveling with Willie Nicol was like going about with a blunderbuss at full cock. It's tempting to wonder if Burns didn't take him along as a kind of deliberate antidote to the lionizing he suspected he was going to receive. Besides enjoying the trip, Burns was also hoping to find a patron and collect old tunes. And he had a dream of being the poet, not just of Ayrshire, but of Scotland. He wished that I, for poor old Scotland's sake, some useful plan or book could make, or sing a song at least. His self-consciousness of his position is shown by the fact that he kept a journal. The uneven nature of that journal suggests that he probably drank himself beyond self-consciousness on several occasions. But the journey began auspiciously enough. Edinburgh, the 25th of August, 1787. I set out for the north in company with my good friend, Mr. Nicol, whose originality of humour promises me much entertainment, from Kerstorfen by Kirkliston and Winchborough. Fine, improving, fertile country. Linlithgow. The appearance of rude, decayed, idle grandeur. Charmingly rural, retired situation. The old royal palace, a tolerably fine but melancholy ruin, sweetly situated on a small elevation by the brink of a loch. Shown the room where the beautiful injured Mary, Queen of Scots, was born. A pretty good old Gothic church. What a poor, pimping business as a Presbyterian place of worship. Dirty, narrow and squalid, stuck in a corner of old popish grandeur such as Linlithgow. The dismay Burns expresses may seem odd today, but it does become understandable when you realise what this place was like on his visit. At that time, only one part of the building was in use, the part behind me here, and it was shut off as a very plain place of Presbyterian worship. And as happened with a lot of churches that had been Catholic churches, the rest of the building was abandoned, perhaps to satanic darkness. It was as if the church was trying to disown its own past. And it's maybe ominous that at the very first stopping point Burns made, he should find a divided church and a ruined palace. It's almost as if the awareness of a divided country with a decaying sense of itself was already beginning to haunt his tour of the Highlands. Mary, Queen of Scots, had been born at Linlithgow. The road away from that birth had led eventually to the loss of Scottish sovereignty. It would also lead to the familiar and interesting anomaly of Scottishness being celebrated in an English accent. We have met to do honour to a great general and a great king. And this rotunda, which is now inaugurated, has been built around one of the most historic spots in Scotland, the borestone on which Bruce set his standard. Here, people will learn why two armies fought each other in these fields, and why, so long after, they should still care about the issues that were at stake on that day.
Come on to Bannockburn, the field of Bannockburn, the hall where glorious Bruce set his standard. Here no Scot can pass uninterested. I fancy to myself that I see my gallant, heroic countrymen coming o'er the hill and down upon the plunderers of their country, the murderers of their fathers, noble revenge and just hate glowing in every vein, striding more and more eagerly as they approach the oppressive, insulting, bloodthirsty foe. I see them meet in gloriously triumphant congratulation on the victorious field, exulting in their heroic royal leader and rescued liberty and independence. Bannockburn seems to have been one of the emotional peaks of the tour for Burns. It came early, and rarely afterwards does he generate quite the same fervour. It wasn't then, of course, as it is now. There was no statue, there were no tourist facilities. It was just the grass and the trees and the wind and the legendary boar stone where Bruce is alleged to have set up his standard. These were enough raw materials to fuel a vivid imagination without any dampening dross of commercialism. Here, where modern Scottishness came to heroic and bloody birth, Burns reaffirmed his sense of a national identity. He was to have need of it as he went on. By the late 18th century, the reality of Scottish history was already receding into the hazy grandeur of myth. Our youth is like the dream of the hunter on the hill of Heath. He sleeps in the mild beams of the sun. He awakes amidst a storm. The red lightning flies around. Trees shake their heads to the wind. He looks back with joy on the day of the sun and the pleasant dreams of his rest. When shall Ossian's youth return? The song rises like the sun in my soul. I feel the joys of other times. When those other times were, seems pretty vague. Ossian was reputed to have been a Gallic bard of the third century AD. He may or may not have existed. Whether he existed or not, he did not write the words attributed to him. The ventriloquist working Ossian from the back was James Macpherson. Resenting the union of 1707, he invented romantic epics of the Celtic past and generously gave them to Ossian. His vision of Scotland, woven from a vivid imagination, was accepted throughout Europe as solid reality. Graffiti will sometimes make a good point. This has been called the Stone of Ossian and was supposed to mark the site of his grave. Yet the genuineness of this stone is no more certain than the genuineness of the works of Ossian. But Robert Burns came here and was moved by this. His willingness to embrace a dream at the expense of the facts shouldn't surprise too many Scots. Macpherson was to some extent a model for what a lot of Scots have done with their history. He, like so many of us, made emotional claims that can't be historically justified. Perhaps the unromantic reality of a country sold for money and the promise of jobs for the boys has created a guilt that can be most easily compensated for by falsifying the past. The irony of Robert Burns paying homage here is that he was the culmination of an alternative tradition, its most spectacular fulfilment, the incarnation almost of the great democratic tradition of Scottish literature, running from Barber's Bruce through Henderson, Dunbar, right through the ballads and to Ferguson. The man who stood approximately here on the 29th of August, 1787, was the one living poetic voice strong enough to reassert powerfully the reality of Scottish history and blow away the mists of Macpherson's Ossian. Did not Ossian hear a voice? Or is it the sound of days that are no more? Or was it possibly the sound of a Scotsman on the make? The voice behind Ossian finished up representing an English constituency in Parliament and left final instructions for James Macpherson's body to be buried in Westminster Abbey. Let the light of memory rise on Ithona. Let me behold again, my friends. The cave of Thona appears with its mossy rocks and bending trees. A stream roars at its mouth. The little birdies blithely sing, while o'er their heads the hazels hang, or lightly flit on wanton wing in the burks of Aberfeldy. Where Macpherson had imagined a monumental landscape inhabited by improbable giants, 
Burns saw a countryside humanized by the everyday emotions of its people. The hoary cliffs are crowned with flowers. White o'er the lens the burny pours, and rising weeps with misty showers the barks of Aberfeldy. Burns is reputed to have sat here and been inspired to write the barks of Aberfeldy. I suppose that's one way to get your breath back. Referring to the making of poetry, T.S. Eliot has suggested that the greater the distance between the experience and the poetry it produces, the greater the art. Perhaps Burns was too close to his material. Certainly, if his reputation as a songwriter were to live on the births of Aberfeldy, it would also die here. It's doubtful if the song he wrote was even as good as the older song it replaced. But T.S. Eliot has also emphasized the importance of journeyman work as a way of keeping the bed made, as it were, in case the muse arrives, ready to be made love to. In that sense, the Burks of Aberfeldy is an important song. It shows the vision of Burns trying to connect with the real landscape of Scotland, not the misty imaginings of Macpherson Ossian. It also demonstrates a method, uncertain at the moment, which Burns would later bring to a heartbreaking perfection. The taking of an old tune like an empty house and repeopling it with his own words, filling it with the laughter and griefs of the present. Here, at the Burks of Aberfeldy, Burns came nearer to the real destination of his Highland tour. Later, when he was ready, the old music would be waiting for him. Neil Gow plays, a short, stout-built, honest Highland figure with his greyish hair shed on his honest social brow, an interesting face marking strong sense, kind open-heartedness mixed with unmistrusting simplicity. The meeting with Neil Gow must have had an inspirational effect on Burns in his ambition to write songs. Gow had been called the best fiddler that ever kittled therm with horsehair. He had in his life achieved the difficult combination of artistic integrity and financial success. A large part of Gow's success was due to the fact that he enjoyed the patronage of three Dukes of Athol. When Burns himself came to visit Blair Athol, he may have wondered if that patronage might extend to himself. The omens were good. He received a warm and generous welcome from the family, headed by the fourth duke. Buns later referred to his time here at Blair Athol as two of the happiest days of his life. It was perhaps a happiness all the more intense for being so fragile. The family were undoubtedly very kind to him. The Duke became a kind of two-day patron. But the way in which Burns left this place emphasizes perhaps the double-edged status he enjoyed in these rich surroundings. The Duke had wanted him to stay longer, but Willie Nicholl wouldn't have it. Remember Burns's traveling companion, the man with a temperament like nitroglycerin. Touch him the wrong way, and he was likely to explode. Nicholl became angry because Burns had stayed here so long. And he demanded that Burns leave. He said, in fact, that he would go on alone if Burns stayed longer. Nicol was a kind of troublesome conscience for Burns, reminding him of who he really was. And he obeyed his promptings. But he was annoyed at his hasty departure. Perhaps he would have been less annoyed if he had understood more fully the Duke's reasons. 
Henry Dundas, the political lieutenant of William Pitt in Scotland, was due at Blair Athol. And the Duke considered that Robert Burns was the best dainty with which to entertain an honored guest. Even in those days, a place like this charged a price of admission for people like Burns. It was what you might call a tax on personal pride. Maybe part payment of that tax was the humble petition of Brewer Water, a poem Burns described as the effusion of a half hour I spent at Brewer. He sent it to the family tutor after he had left Blair Athol. My lord, I know your noble ear, woe ne'er assails in vain. Emboldened thus, I beg you'll hear your humble slave complain how saucy Phoebus scorching be. Not very interesting in itself, the poem does offer an interesting subtext, suggestive of the division in Burns between his natural pride and his position of dependency on the hospitality of the wealthy. He was perhaps already realizing that success and acceptance had a price, part of which involved compromising the broadness of his voice, though his native accent could never be entirely stifled. I am, although I say it myself, worth gone a mile to see. It may be that the comfort and sociability of Blair Athol and the idyll of Brewer Water stayed with him for some time as he travelled, investing the harsher reality of contemporary Scotland with a surface pleasantness. Sunday, the 2nd of September, cross the Spey and come down the stream to Pitmain. Strath's rich, Les Environs picturesque, Craigow Hill, Ruthven of Badenoch, barracks, wild and magnificent. The magnificence cast deep shadows. Ruthven was like a nun holding the ashes of more than one failed attempt to re-establish the Stuart monarchy. It had been built after 1715 to keep the Jacobites in check and had been taken by them in 1746. Here, the defeated remnants of Prince Charlie's army had rallied after Culloden, only to be advised by him that they should disperse. What Ruthven hinted at, a later place would state unequivocally. Thursday, the 6th of September, come over Culloden Moor. Reflections on the field of battle. What those reflections were, Burns doesn't say. The certainty of response he felt at Bannockburn seems to have evaporated. There were for Burns 10 days between Bannockburn and Culloden, and in that short time he travelled the distance between certainty and doubt, the journey Scotland itself had made. No wonder he was silent here. This terrain intimidates glib responses, and any honest Scot who stands here stands not just on a physical march, but on a psychological one as well. Culloden is, among other things, a monument to the complexity of being Scottish. The battlefield at Culloden was like a physical enactment of the warring impulses within the Scots' sense of their own identity. The incompetence of Prince Charles as a military commander merely orchestrated a confusion that was already there. The divisiveness implicit in the clan system reached its last self-destructive expression here. Clan fought against clan. People of the same country saw themselves to some degree as members of different nations, Scotland and Britain. In that conflict, Scotland as it had been died and was buried. Fort George Burns wrote in the journal, and that was all. Perhaps to a Scottish patriot like him, this place spoke for itself. If Culloden was the grave of an old Scottishness that often preyed on itself, Fort George was where they drove the stake through its heart to prevent the resurrection of the problems it had caused. The barracks at Ruthven are Ruven, as it has been alternatively called, and perhaps the two ways of saying the word indicate the ambiguity of the Scots towards themselves. Well, that place had been an amateurish attempt to undermine Scottishness as a separate identity. Fort George was the utterly professional fulfillment of that purpose. It became a fifth column against Scottishness in the heart of Scotland, and it worked. It became a way of changing Scotland from being a threat to empire to being a means of extending empire, 
a way of shoring it up. Squad will move to the right in threes. Right! Ten! Into this place came the descendants of the dead clans of Culloden, recruited into Highland regiments that weren't so much an expression of Scottishness as a translation of that Scottishness into a variant of Englishness. And in the translation, a great deal was lost. The meaning of this place is unmistakable. I can believe that in one sense, the Highland tour of Robert Burns came to an end here. The poetry he had already written was to some extent a dream of Scotland. The success of the poetry had given him the unexpected opportunity to travel and to examine in some detail the reality of Scotland. That reality made it harder to sustain the dream. In this place, Robert Burns may have realized how difficult it would be for him to fulfill his original dream of being the nation's bard. He was like one man trying to storm an impregnable fortress his individuality overwhelmed by a formidable piece of masonry. The Highland Tour, which had started as a kind of triumphal progress, became a kind of retreat, a retreat from some of the possibilities that had seemed to present themselves but there remained the consolation of being accepted into the houses of the nobility. Cross Spey to Fochabers, the fine palace, worthy of the noble, the polite, the generous proprietor. The Duke makes me happier than ever great man did. Noble, princely, yet mild, condescending and affable, gay and kind. The Duchess charming, witty, kind and sensible. God bless them. But Willie Nicholl, never inclined to bless anyone, was again demanding they move on. His presence hadn't helped Burns in the realization of one of his purposes for the tour, the getting of patronage. Burns's chances of finding a patron receded with Castle Gordon. Come on to Castle Corder, where Macbeth murdered King Duncan. Saw the bed in which King Duncan was stabbed. You have to wonder which bed that was. It seems that Scotland's history was already in the market for the tourist trade. When a country's history loses its dynamic, it becomes easy for it to be turned into a commodity, something that can be reduced to whatever image will sell best. Even from a place as central to the idea of Scottish sovereignty as Schoon, the trappings of real power had been removed, and Scotland was left to relate to an imitation of its own.